is the potter's house. In the book of Isaiah, we read, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art our potter, we are all the works of thy hand. Here we see that the Lord, the Father, and the potter are one. Now the word potter, as defined in scripture, is imagination. Here we are told it is to form a resolution, to determine, such as in the beginning, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That is to form a resolution. Now we are told that that is the potter, and it is the father, and it is the Lord. Now in Jeremiah, we are told, we went down to the potter's house. First of all, he said, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house. And there he was, working at his wheel. And the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. But he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. For you just discovered that the potter who is our father, who is the Lord, is our own wonderful human imagination. Now he is working with clay and we are told that we are the clay. So I turn for a moment and I wonder what am I imagining concerning myself for that is the clay imagining is God in action it's the potter in action it is the Lord himself the father in action it is my concept of myself what I would like it to be or is it spoiled I don't discard it I simply rework it into another vessel as it seemed good to me the potter to do am I living as I would like to live do I have an income equal to my needs do I have an income equal to the things I'd like to do or am I limiting myself based upon what I think that I could do there is no limit placed upon the potter's ability to reshape that image so will I now actually take the challenge and reshape the vessel? For the vessel is made of clay and we are the clay. Will I now this very moment change my concept of myself, my concept of those that are in my world, and see them as I would like to see them in my world? Will it work? Well, now let us take a look now at the definition of imagination as given to us by man. Scripture defines it as God. Scripture defines it as God the Father, the potter who fashions everything in the world. But now, we use it so loosely in this world. We are told that the simple apprehension of corporeal objects if present is sense that is sense perceived this is now sense perceived I can see you and if you speak and I hear you that is sense perceived and you are present therefore that is real they say if absent it is imagination in other words it isn't real it isn't sense perceived now we'll take one of the senses. We'll take the sense of smell. 
since smell is a chemical sense, a contact is necessary for perception. You have to actually have a chemical contact to smell in this world. Now I ask you to join with me. Maybe you do not like flowers as I do. Can you smell a rose? And it's not present. There aren't any roses here or in your presence. But can you now imagine a rose and smell it? I can. It's so distinct. Well, if the rose is not here when I smell it, why is its fragrance in the air? When it depends upon a chemical contact. You cannot smell anything in this world without a chemical contact. I go into the kitchen, so I smell gas, and it's not lit, but I notice I smell gas. It's a chemical contact. Then I notice that the wind, leaving the window open, blew out the little pilot light. I turn it on, and nothing happens. Therefore, I know the pilot is gone, and I light it. But I could smell that was a chemical contact. If I could not detect it, I could just simply become asphyxiated. If I had lost that olfactory nerve and could not reach that chemical contact. But now here, there's no rose, and I can actually smell a rose. Now, you say, well, what does that mean? It means so much to me. You can smell money. Money has an odor unlike anything in this world. Entirely different. You can actually take it and smell it. A money bag is more fragrant to the miser than all the flowers of the world. It's a pleasant odor to him. Not to me. I need money. I have to have money to pay all the normal expenses in this world. But it's not to me a fragrant odor. But I use this principle towards getting money towards meeting all the obligations of life for I am obligated as you are so I go down to the potter's house well I can sit in a chair I can stand at a bar I can do it wherever I am I am right there in the potter's house for I have found the potter the potter is my imagination and the potter is the father the Lord God Almighty and I found him so I don't have to go any place outside of where I stand to be in the potter's house. And now I will see what he's doing. So I see what I'm doing. What am I imagining? For that's what he's working on. So I went down to the potter's house and I simply saw what he was doing. What am I imagining? Is it a good image that I am forming of myself and my friends and things that I love in this world? Or am I critical? Am I simply making a mess of the talent? And I find quite often I am not using it wisely. I tell you that the worship of God is to use his gifts. That's the only way you really worship God. He gave you a talent. Well, the talent is himself. It comes through, naturally, the five senses. I may be denied four of them. As many are born minus one, two, three, or maybe four. Most would have the sense of touch. But some are born blind, or they go blind. Some go deaf. Some lost the sense of sound, I mean speech. All these things, but nevertheless, I can use in my imagination all these talents. Physically, they may be denied me, but I still have an open door from within, and I can use it from within. I need not actually have them all open on the outside if I'm born restricted. I can still call upon them from within, as I do now, to smell the rose. A friend of mine, she's gone from this world now. 
in New York City many, many years ago. I told a story similar to this tonight. And sitting in my audience, she said, well now, I'm going to test this. And in the silence, she embraced a huge bouquet of roses. She lived in the towers, the Waldorf Astoria. So when she went home that night, as she went down the hallway towards her room, she detected a strong odor of roses. And she stopped at one door, thinking it might be fear. It was permeating the entire hallway. She kept on going, and it got stronger and stronger. And when she opened her door, there were three dozen long beauties on her bureau. The window was open just a little bit, and it came bringing the odor through into the hallway. There was no note on it, but here were these lovely roses. The next day, she was informed how it happened. That that night, the English-speaking Union gave a party for the present Queen's mother, who was Queen Elizabeth, but not Queen in the true sense of the word. She was George's wife. But she was queen while he reigned. And they had these enormous flowers raised for the occasion. And at the end of the banquet, when a thousand of them sat at this dinner, they wondered what to do with the roses. And the head waiter said, well, Mrs. Niemeyer loves flowers, especially roses. Send three dozen up to her room. You either throw them away or find some way to use them wisely. And so Mrs. Niemeyer was given three dozen of these beauties, which she certainly did not expect. But she thought she would try it. And she embraced in her mind's eye, and she could smell the roses. And then came three dozen beauties into her room. I have known people who will take money in their mind's eye and actually feel it, and it's not present, and smell it and count it off. And then it happens just like that. Man is not completely confined to the little garment and the five senses through which contact is made with the world. He has imagination. Imagination is God. That's the potter. That is the Lord. That is our Father. And he gave us himself. And the only way to truly worship God is to use his gifts and he actually gave me himself because I can say I am and that's his name now I discover he is my imagination so Blake says I know of no other Christianity and no other gospel than the liberty both of body and mind to exercise the divine arts of imagination and then he adds the apostles knew of no other gospel. We are living in a world of imagination. If I say to the average person who believes in God, the whole vast world was created by God. We are living in a world of God. They would bow and admit to that. But let me say, the world in which we live is a world of imagination. And they hold their hand up wait a minute this is real what you imagine is unreal and yet everything they tell me is real was once only imagined the clothes you wear had to be first imagined the chairs in which you are seated the building in which we are now housed everything first had to be imagined before it was objectified and executed in this world. So what is now real to us and seemingly an objective fact was once only imagined. We had to imagine going to the moon before we did it. And everything here was in the potter's hand. <clears throat> and that potter is your own wonderful human imagination. Everything in this world 
that we call natural has an imaginal cause and not a natural cause. A natural cause only seems. It is a delusion of the perishing memory. That's the one thing that suffers when God became man. He had to completely forget that he was God <clears throat> when he became man. And so memory faded completely. But the reality remained, for he is man's own wonderful human imagination. Man is all imagination, and God is man, and exists in us and we in him.